Welcome here. Absolutely delighted, uh, excited to welcome you here. It's a, a very great day. It's not just an OII event. I'd like you to know that this is quite a uh, collaborative event. It's actually under the umbrella of the eHorizons Institute, which is a, a new virtual institute, uh, part of the James Martin School for the 21st Century. And um, uh, James Martin was just here yesterday uh, uh, collecting a medal, the Sheldonian Medal, for his contributions to the university and the life of the university. And the, the Horizons Institute is one of about 10 institutes of that group. And, and it's done in collaboration, eHorizons, with the Oxford Internet Institute um, and also the Oxford eResearch Center. Uh, the Oxford Internet Institute is, of course, a, a department in the Social Sciences Division. and. The Oxford E Research Center is a new department within the Math and Physical Sciences Division, and it's uh, uh, the E Horizons Institute is a bridge between our two divisions, we hope. And it's also done in collaboration with the Electronics and Computer Science Department um, of the University of Southampton. Wendy Hall and her colleagues uh, were very helpful in putting this together. And all the organizers uh, are very appreciative of the British Computer Society for also helping out. But uh, with those credits and acknowledgments, uh, let me introduce our speaker. I, uh, in 1989, a graduate of Oxford University, Tim Berners-Lee, invented the World Wide Web. And I think um, it's quite wonderful that we're here in the physics lecture hall because uh, he read physics at Oxford. Uh, coincidentally, James Martin also read physics at Oxford. So. Oxford and physics have done well, I think, very well. And uh, when, Tim was, uh, when Tim invented the World Wide Web, he made this contribution while he was working at CERN. He wasn't trying to invent the future of communications. He was trying to help scientists collaborate, I believe. But it ended up uh, with a major advancement in the way we communicate with one another. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee is also the director of the World Wide Web Consortium. He's a senior researcher at MIT's uh, CSAIL, SAIL, and professor of computer science at Southampton. Um, Tim holds the 3Com Founders Chair at the Laboratory uh, for Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he directs the World Wide Web Consortium, which is an open forum of companies and organizations with the mission to lead the web to its full potential. Uh, with a background in systems design, in real-time communication and text processing software development, Tim wrote the first web client uh, and server in 1990. And before coming to CERN, Tim worked with image computer systems of Ferndown, Dorset, England, and before that as a principal engineer with Plessy Telecommunications in Poole, England. And, uh, with that, I'd just say that uh, Tim got his photograph taken be behind the chalkboards in the fi old physics lecture hall. But welcome to the new physics lecture hall, Tim. Please. Well, it's, it's quite an honor and pretty strange to be, <laughs> to be invited here. Yeah, when I, I must say that when I was here, this wasn't. Uh, so I got, in 1973, my first lectures on the, the, the very sort of 50 foot, 50,000 foot introduction to physics that you can actually get in three years, in the, which started off in the lecture in the Lindemann, Clarendon, Clarendon Labs on either side. So uh, it, yes, it is strange to, to be here and not taking notes and not sitting, <laughs> and if you're sitting at the back, well, I suppose I was a lot of, a lot of the time making sure that I could sort of within a position to get away and go punting or going and you know, all the other things, wonderful distractions around here. So I was going to talk about uh, the internet and uh, at, uh, the in uh, technology and society and privacy and all the, and the concerns about the uses of, uh, of information in this day and age, but the previous speaker has more or less covered the ground completely in, that area in, the, in the earlier talk. So I'm just going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the future of the web and the future of our th uh, thinking about it, uh, both analyzing it and building it, uh, which and a lot of that for me is about building a web of data rather than a web of, uh, of hypertext, because our web of hypertext, as you can see, uh, as uh, everybody knows about the web of data, hasn't really spread worldwide yet, so we're still working on it. So I'm going to talk about uh, philosophical engineering. What, what, philosophical engineering? Well, hey, 
This is a place that calls physics, or did in some of the things that I read or took or exams I took, experimental philosophy. So if, that, if physics is experimental philosophy, if, and if, if philosophy is the, is the answer to life, the ultimate question, life, the universe, and everything, and physics is what you can determine about it by doing experiments, dropping things and stuff like that, and, and beating on things, then I think that what we do, when we take computers and, and networks and we build things like the web, then actually we have a tremendous medium in which we can sort of play God in re, because we design the microscopic rules. And there's an interesting relationship with physics. When we do physics, we imagine some microscopic rules. And we then try to predict using mathematics what the world would be like if those were the case. And then, but, with, but with the web, what we do is we, make, we design the microscopic world rules and we produce a system. The, so what is interesting, of course, is that you know, we, can, we can talk a lot about the microscopic rules, and we can look, about, look at the microscopic behavior. So people can, you know, you read in the newspaper about how the web is doing this and the web is doing that, and how suddenly blog, blog, the blogosphere has overrun the planet and everybody is blogging, uh, or how the Wikipedia is so exciting. But uh, although just the web itself, how, how exciting it is that everything seems to be on it. But of course, the web is actually defined, the infrastructure is defined by some simple protocols. And what, for me, is becoming more and more interesting is actually the gap between those two things. It's the gap between the microscopic rules and the macroscopic rules. And as we de define more and more powerful, new, exciting systems, we define new computer-to-computer -computer protocols which do new things on behalf of people, form new types of communications in our society. And they are regulated by the rules of the these the rules of the computer protocols, and we are regulated more or less by rules of society. And when you put all that together and then apply some, the, the system, which is all of us, <laughs> and behaving as a, rather, uh, as a strange and unruly bunch, then macroscopic phenomena occur. And that connection between them is the most interesting thing. In physics, and we do analysis, but when we build systems out there on the internet, we're doing synthesis. But always, of course, they're really coupled. So all the, whenever we build something, then the first thing we do is we try and figure out what it is that has, hap that has happened that we've then created. So people start to measure the number of blogs that are out there and start to do statistics about it and so on. It's very clear that the rules are social as well as technical. Now, the social rules we can change. Uh, it seems to be more difficult when you're a geek sitting there programming to change the social rules. But in fact, so, we, so when we started off, everybody assumed that the social rules would be the ones we had already. They would be good enough, and we'd bend them. But then now it seems clear that there are some cases when we seriously would have to re-engineer the social rules because the, combination, because the technology, which is going to happen anyway, is going to need new social rules. That has been clear for, for many years now. So let's look at one example of some, uh, some engineering email. It's a very simple system. It's a store and forward system. It the rule is that if you're a computer and you get a, a, an email from another computer, you look at the header on it and then you send it on to a suitable computer which will be closer to its destination. And if everybody does that and nobody sends too many silly messages, then the email system will work very well. And so that system was put together. The, the simple mail transfer protocol was defined. And the academ academic society used email wonderfully. And it was great. They also used network news transfer protocol, the, the network news. But that involved everybody sending things to the same subject. And that didn't scale so well. But email did scale really well until the knobs were adjusted slightly, until the same microscopic rules would, were run in a commercial environment. So when, the, when that happened, suddenly there was just so much temptation, so much commercial pressure to actually bug people with stupid messages that basically now the email system is, a, is in a complete heap. There are lots of people who, unless they're protected by very good system management, just can't use email anymore. They're giving it up and going back to using the telephone. <laughs> now, really? OK, you know, you, those people who laugh, actually, are, 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 you're probably all here. You're sitting behind internet service providers in your university who provide you with all kinds of wonderful things that filter email. But if you go to real people out there who just have old-fashioned ISPs, uh, the, it, it's, it's appalling. And not only that, but the viruses that they get with that email take down their computers, turn it into worthless mush. And they have to throw the computer away. 
I know people who, to whom that has happened. So now let's look at the web. So the web rules, skipping the sort of two-hour lecture on the, on the architecture of the web, basically the fundamental rule about the web is you use these URIs for you know, these things that start HTTP, Sometimes they are called URLs. We won't get into that because that's part of the two-hour talk. But <laughs> we will call them URIs. Uh, that's the general, uh, that's the global, that's the universal space. And you use these. So if you have a document, you give it a URI. And in fact, if you can give pieces within the document URIs, that's the anchors in the hypertext world, the URIs, that's even better because then people can make links into different places in the document. So the important thing is to give things URIs. There's another really important part of the web architecture, which uh, I haven't thought of a good name for. Ladder of authority to interpret is horrible, but that's what it is. There is a sort of ladder by which you have your web browser has the authority to present you with a piece of hypertext. When you click on a link and load something, the web browser takes the bits and interprets them according to the hypertext markup language specification. Why does it do that? It does that because the hypertext markup language specification is mentioned in the registry for the text HTML mind type, the internet content type. And the internet content types are registered. Why, does, why look in the registry? Well, if you go and look at the URI spec, sorry, if you go and look at the HTTP spec, it will say that the, the content type field indicates the content type. And to know what that is, you should go and look at the registry. So the RFC for HTTP points to the IANA registry. So why are you reading the HTTP spec anyway? Well, when the URI, they remember that URI that you clicked on originally to see the page? It started HTTP. And the URI spec doesn't tell you what HTTP means, but it goes and tells you to look in another registry. And that other registry has a pointer there that says if the field, that first field in the URI is HTTP, you must read the HTTP spec. And the HTTP spec points to the MIME, mentions MIME types and points to the MIME type registry. The MIME type registry points to the HTTP, the HTML spec. The HTML spec says you, that this can be rendered as hypertext. And when that has been done, the intent of the author will have been preserved and relayed to the reader. And that's actually quite important. And I just mention it because Right, a lot of people like you are probably going back and programming new systems every, uh, every other day. And if you don't know about this, you can break the web by putting things out there when not making sure that you've registered your mind type, not making sure, realizing that, for example, if you invent a new uh, you're a life scientist and you make a new ID space called LSID. And LSID allows you to give things names, but doesn't necessarily give you a way of getting from that name to a representation of the document or from data about what the thing is. So that ladder of authority is important. And the technical architecture group of W3C tries to spend some time sort of looking for holes in it and, uh, and sponsoring groups to patch them up. And every now and again, it gets a little too philosophical. And, uh, uh, and people go away into the weeds. But most of the time, the, you know, the important thing is keeping the engineering structure there. Of course, it's important to use standards. And most of these standards, the most important one is URIs. And all the other ones are pointed to indirectly through these registries and these specifications. But if you use standards, which are standards and are registered but nobody else uses, it really doesn't work. So we have HTTP. That you can use other protocols. You can use FTP, but FTP is what, HTTP is what people use. And HTML, and it's XML form, SVG, CSS, the style sheets, the document object model, which is the spec which really makes all this Ajax, Zooty Ajax stuff like Google Maps work and XSLT and so on, there's quite a long list, which I won't bore you with. So those are some technical rules, and those provide just an infrastructure of ways which, which describe how when you poke a computer, what it should do. And there are implicit and explicit rules about how you use all these things. I didn't mention all the, the, the rules about the domain name system, about how you go and get yourself a domain name if you're serving things, and the rules which ensure that if you're running a server with this domain name, you actually are the person who owns the domain name and therefore who owns all those URIs, and therefore your server speaks with authority. There, but going back to much more basic things, there's a kind of a rule out there that you put, serve useful stuff. If you put, give somebody a URI, paste it on the side of a bus, and you, know, and you say something like Oxford University lecture recording policy and put a URI there, people would expect to be able to look it up and get you know, all this information about what happens to you when you're in a lecture theater and what can, how you, you can be abused as a result. So uh, if you put something else there, it's, it, it's disappointing. If there's a hypertext link which goes to uh, a 404, it's disappointing. 
And it's really, it's somebody's fault. It's either the person who published the URI, or it's the person who made the link and got the URI wrong. URI wrong. But it's a good idea to serve useful stuff. And it's a good idea in that stuff that you serve, whatever language it's in, to make useful links. Of course, when we started, it was essential to make links. But now a lot of people think, oh, no, why bother? I can just stick stuff there, and people will find it with Google. Well, guess how Google works? <laughs> All right, what does Google read? read book, Google doesn't read the documents. Google reads the links. Google only works, and it works so well, because it is looking at the matrix of links where those links have been lovingly made by hand, by person, or, my, or by machine, but carefully made, and made to relevant places. So the network of links is really important, and making them work there is really important. It's part of the protocol which makes it work. And it happens that when you make good links, people come to your web page, they read your ads, you get money, you get kudos. You know, the social protocols, all this very complicated social system around this, including now all kinds of things like trading links for you know, Google Karma for money and for ads and so on, doing tr link trades and all that sort of thing. All these things have grown up based on these laws. And of course, all the existing things, the existing things like the intellectual property laws and the laws of fraud, which you know, you'd think, actually, uh, some people, well, it, you'd think that they didn't apply on the internet, but they do. If you fraudulently put your, uh, say that this email is from somebody else, then that's, uh, you're actually lying. And that's, if you obtain money, it, money by it, then that is illegal. So all those laws uh, out there are part of the social thing which makes it work. And of course, you know, what happens is we end up with this web. And one of the nice things is when we have the web is that Google f folks find that when you look at the web of links and you take eigenvectors, you find that those eigenvectors are the states. They, they correspond, the, the eigenvectors of the link matrix correspond to human topics of interest, to human topics of conversation which is magic. Actually, you find the things which are important to people by just taking, by changing, swiveling around the axes from what the web that's out there and to a, so that you have them aligned so that suddenly you can find the important topics instead of the important documents. So we ended up with a system where suddenly the link, the macroscopic, which seems so complicated, could suddenly, this link, the relationship between them suddenly just seems to be an eigenvector transformation, the, the, the support vector machinery that Google does. And that is really nifty. But remember, that Google is doing the analysis. We haven't done anything so sophisticated as to build something and say, you know, well, I, let's build something to make conversations, because that's what we really want to do. And, let's, and, and I bet we could do that by producing something whose I, producing a matrix whose eigenvectors would be, those would be those conversations. We haven't got as subtle as that. But maybe in the future, when we have a lot of data out there, we will have to think carefully about how, what, what you will be able to do with it before we let it, all, uh, let it all loose. Looking at more things you can do with the, uh, in terms of rules. Suppose you take the web rules. Now you add two more rules. You add a simple editor. And you add a sense that in this website, Anybody can put anything there, but this is passé sur le sauvegarde des citoyens. Is that what they put in the French in the parks in Paris? They say little notice saying this notice, this park is placed under the, under the, in the safekeeping of the citizens. I thought that's really nice. I made him sort of pick up after your dog. And basically, and all those things. And the wiki, and, and the wiki is an area, a website, which says, pick up after your dog. Your appreciation to detail is appreciated. Your, 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 your uh, attention to detail is appreciated, I think the phrase is. And anybody can, web, can edit it. And it happens that, plus or minus a few vandals, and the war against them, you end up with, ta-da, Wikipedia. And who'd have known that it would, it would work? Now, if you'd have put all the web scientists together and the social scientists together and got them to predict what would happen, I bet a lot of them would say that it would, have been a, it would be a total mess. Blogs are interesting as well. Blogs, the little extra bits of technology are added, like trackback, the ability to, to, to make a, a blog point to other blogs which mention it. And the result of this blogging thing is this blogosphere. I understand you call it now. At least when I started a blog recently, I got these messages welcoming, welcoming me to the blogosphere. So the semantic web is a web of data. It has rules. They're basically very, very similar. Uh, the idea is that 
well, we should be able to get it all the data out there just as, and treat it as data just as easily as we can get it. documents out there and treat them as documents. We use your eyes, except now, instead of using them for anchors in documents, we use them for abstract concepts. We can use a URI now for anything, including you. In fact, uh, has anybody here got a URI? Yes, hold it hand up. Way, way, way high. Yes, okay, wave hands. Yes, you see, some people have URIs, okay? And you, uh, are those, who's, who's got a URI which starts with HTTP so I can look, where I can look it up and get data back about your semantic web URI? Yeah. You see, there are people here which have URIs. It's not just web pages. Thank you. Yes, keep up the good work. Send me an email. I'll put links to you. Um, so what happens with the semantic web is we have standards. We have a different set of standards because we, this is, we have languages for the data and information about data and for logic. But actually, we have similar sorts of social rules. First one is serve, so, serve useful stuff. And one of the problems we've actually had with the semantic web, I only recent, recently realized, is we haven't been doing that. We've had lots and lots of people putting their data into, these, into OWL and RDF. And they've been putting it into great big RDF stores and using their inference engines on it. But they haven't left it on the web. And of course, they haven't left it on the web for people to find. Other people haven't linked to it. It hasn't been reusable. We haven't got that magic reuse. The whole value add of the web is serendipitous reuse. It's when you, you, because you put something out there for one person, and it gets used by who knows who. But in general, most of the stuff which is used on the web is being used for something, a purpose which, for which it was not originally intended. And the same with data. We want to put data out there for one purpose and then find that it gets linked into all kinds of data. And that's been not happening because we forgot. Serve useful stuff. Not to mention make useful links. So when we ha do a physics experiment and we have a reading or we have a piece of apparatus, then we should give it a URI. And then we should make connections from the readings to the apparatus so that if I want to know which piece of apparatus took the reading, I can go and look it up in real time, de do the HTTP thing, and pick up the details of what was it, what sort of an instrument was it, and, when, and then find out when it was calibrated last, and so on. So I should be able to follow links through the data, just as I follow links through the documents. And this has been a problem, because we've sort of forgotten about that in our urge to get involved with designing these logical languages. One of the rules which actually is happening is to share ontologies, that if you're going to put data out there, and you're going to use a URI, Remember, everything's identified with URI, so temperature is going to be a URI. It really helps if you use the same URI as everybody else. And, well, but getting everybody to use the same URI is really, really expensive because you have to get a lot of people in the room together. So, in fact, what you start off doing is just try and find somebody else that use, have, has a URI for temperature. Make sure they mean the same thing. We're all talking Celsius. We haven't got any of those Americans present. And as long as we're all talking the same type of meaning for for the temperature property, the temperature relationship, then we use the same URI. And that means that when somebody sees our data and their data, then they can merge it all together. So we do. Sharing your ontologies actually is, is, is working fairly well. Of course, those, those ontologies are published in the web. And you can look them up. And you can find information about them. It's just the data that we're not sharing. Agreeing on an ontology is, is, is hard, because you have to get more and more people into a room. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. So now I'm going to do very fast. Uh, just a quick, for those people who've never come across the semantic web before, so if you've got, it, you've got your own URI, you close your eyes, take a nap, catch up on email, then uh, but for the, those people who haven't come across it, just a very, very quick flying <coughs> overview of what the semantic web actually is. Right? It's about using URIs. It's about URIs. You don't, you don't argue about what color means or whether it should be spelt with a U as so many, lots of XML schema developers have, and lots of people developing things like EDI and, and so on. You, do, you just, you use the URI so you can have your version of color and they can have theirs. North's going to be RGB and theirs can be Pantone. It doesn't matter. And if you really want to decide to go to the effort of agreeing on one, then you do that. But then, and there's a certain amount of cost you put into agreeing, and there's a certain amount of benefit you get out. And you weigh that up before you do it. So first, everything has a URI, things and concepts and classes. Most of our data at the moment is in relational databases. The atomic unit of relational database is that intersection, the cell, where a row of information about something intersects with a column of properties of all those things. And that actually, that one little piece of information, it's a triple. It's three things. It's 
a relationship between, it's the relationship property, some property like uh, my car is the subject and the, co the color is the property and the value is green or something. You can also represent that uh, in, the, when, in the good old fashioned way using these uh, whiteboards and things, blackboards and things, uh, using circles and arrows. A very natural way to, to represent information. In fact, circles and arrows, these triplets, sub, which relate a subject to property and a value, is more or less the simplest way that you can represent all knowledge if you could make by making graphs. And you can encode it in XML, and we have a standard of doing that. It's called RDF. And so you can take any information and encode it as circles and arrows. You can take a table, and it, a square table, just like a relational database, you can encode it in circles and arrows. You can take a tree and you can encode it in circles and arrows. But the neat thing is, if both systems have used the same URI, you can then merge those two graphs. And you end up with a graph where you've got lots of information about one thing from both systems. Can you put that back in the database? No, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You, uh, it won't go back in a database. It won't go back in an XML tree. It's a graph. It's, but the, gra the graph is more general, so the semantic web data has to be a graph. It's like the World Wide Web. It's a graph. Life is a graph. Life is multiply connected. Your life is a graph. So you need to have a graph-like or thing, a web, to describe it. <coughs> nice thing about RDF data, as I said, is you can merge RDF data if you have a blue document and a red document and a green document, and they use the same URIs for the nodes, then you can just merge them together. You just load all those documents, and then you have the combined picture. And that looks really simple. And it is really simple. But you can't do it with all the XML systems out there, because they don't have a concept of what is actually, which bit of the document is about what. They haven't actually modeled things. So what we're doing with the Semantic Web is just actually expressing knowledge about things instead of expressing tables. Which have, got, um, which have got no well-defined semantics. Very, very simple. We can actually, for example, where we have tables where the columns mean the same thing, we can use links to say that. So we can link together the concept of, what, of zip code and postal code. And in the cases where they actually mean the same thing, then we can use the same URI for them or state that the two, two URIs are equivalent. Yes, we've got a URI to mean equivalent. The interesting thing is that different communities, when they share data, use different vocabularies. This is not dissimilar to any language, that if you're going to communicate, you have to share a language. On the semantic web, you share these vocabularies, these ontologies. And it's, as always with all languages, an effort to get people to agree on a language. And very beneficial when you have people in a large community agreeing. But on the other hand, it also takes a lot of time. So in fact, the semantic web, the reason that it works is only apparent if you realize that a person is involved, or any agent, is involved in many communities of different sizes at different times. One of the ways I've tried to uh, illustrate this is I tried all kinds of different crossword puzzle pictures, came back to the London Underground map. That, so these are applications you might have in an enterprise, and the your customer relationship management is the CRM, and a calendar application, and this blob is my camera. When I take a picture, the only thing, because this is not a very sophisticated camera, it has no, G, you know, no GPS. When I take this picture, the camera knows when the picture was taken. And that data is stored on here, and that's all it takes. However, if I have marked in my calendar the fact that I'm giving a lecture here, and I'm, I was smart enough to have a pointer, some data somewhere about the hall, which has got the GPS coordinates, then, my, then if all that data connects, then through the timeline, I can join to the event and from the event, I can figure out where I am. And therefore, I can put geospatial coordinates on this picture. And I've done this, actually. With a, I've done it by going skiing with a, GS, with a GPS device and the camera and this camera and taking photographs. And then you run a bit of software, which then interpolates what looks at the GPS. And, and you, given the data that the, the person holding the, the GPS was the same as the person holding the camera, can then figure out when the where the photographs were taken. And in fact, there's the, all kinds of websites now are doing fun things with maps and photographs, uh, doing that sort of thing. And but th 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 that's just one example of a very general thing, that you can take data and suddenly put your photographs on a map because you, you cross these things. And you find, so you find that these, there are a few, the main lines here are the concepts which are shared between applications. And where applications share, share these, some of these, big mainline things like time and personal identity and geospatial position, then they connect together very easily with many applications. But some applications, you know, some, some concepts like 
Acme Engineering Company's part number, they are only shared between a few applications. This line doesn't go any further. It's a dead end. It just connects three things. And the great advantage of that is when you want to agree on the ontology for part number, the URI for part number, and whether the part numbers are going to start with PN or P and how many digits they're going to have, you only have to talk to all the people in Acme Engineering to decide that. You don't have to have an international standards body. So there are advantages to having these local standards and advantages to having the big ones. Here's an actual example from Biopax, people using semantic web to integrate in the life sciences and in the, uh, in the drug discovery area. The, the concept of gene is in the middle. The, or in, uh, the brown blobs are concepts, and, the, and then the Venn diagram lumps are the ontologies, and you can see that concepts are shared. So a protein is shared by many ontologies, by many different, if you like, different applications, which now become integratable like one great big application. So it's understanding how this works, well, I think answers a lot of questions people have about how i actually going to go about using the semantic web when it takes off. I think actually, when you look at the systems like this, I think we have to build a fractal system. When you look at most of the systems which turn up in nature, very many of them are fractal. There are some interesting results mathematically which show that fractal systems are actually optimal for communicating across complicated networks. With uh, so, and I th so I have a hunch that we should be aiming to build a fractal system. And so, and, and, after, with, and to a certain extent, if you look at society, you'll find a fractal tangle. Uh, so it, uh, the semantic web will end up as a big fractal tangle, and that's okay. And in fact, that's going to make it easier. Because, so now I'm going to show you some recently resolved, highly, high, recently released, highly, uh, very accurate, uh, recently collected data, uh, <coughs> in which we, uh, we looked at the cost of making ontologies on different scales. You see, when, if the world is, is fractal, it sort of has the same sort of, it's self-similar at different scales, and there are roughly 10 to the 10, there are roughly 10 to the 10 people on the planet, right? So there are roughly 10 orders of magnitude of people when you look at society. Starting off with 10 to the zero, which is me, and then my team, which happens to have exactly 10 people in it, my group, which has 100 people in it, and so on. And depending on where you live, your nation may come up sort of a, uh, is near the bottom of the, uh, on the larger scale, your, your nation or your state or your country, and then the planet has got of the order of 10 giga people. Uh, now, it's, uh, it's well known that when you, when, let's suppose we're doing a project and we're going to do the fractal thing, we're going to find that we're going to use one ontology which is global. We're going to use time. So we're going to use the ISO ontology for time. And then we're going to use a few European Commission, one European Commission on one British, and so on. We're going to end up with, with only 10 ontologies. It just happens that we've got one in every scale. So how long does it take to develop these ontologies? Because people have said that it is an intolerable burden to have to develop so many ontologies to describe all of human knowledge and all the data out there. Because people have tried things like the Psych Project, which tried to do it all in one great big lump. And you know, actually, they tried to make it all one big global ontology. And that turned out to be rather difficult. It's, you know, it scaled to them. They did an amazing job. But, it, but it, uh, in the end, it didn't scale. So let's suppose I only need to make one ontology for me. Now, as I'm just me, I have to discuss with myself about it. And that takes me about a week. <laughs> so what with you know, having marmalade sandwiches and, and cups of coffee and things like that. Uh, so, so, so the cost of that ontology to me is one week of work. However, when I do it with my team, instead of all discussing it with the ten of us, because we have better things to do, we actually trust uh, four people to do it. Uh, and so we have a committee of four people which designs the ontology. Now, of course, it's well known that a committee of four people to come to any conclusion takes, to take, or a committee of n people takes n of order n squared time because they all have to talk to each other about it. Uh, so this committee is going to take 16 weeks. <sighs> I'm going to be waiting for that ontology maybe. But the good news is that because of average, the cost of getting that sort of ontology, because it's shared among 10 people, is, is 1.6. It's not too much more than the cost of... Uh, of designing an ontology by myself. And you can see similarly that when my group makes ontologies, even though there are 100 people, they, admit a, they, they elect a, a committee of size 7, it, and it takes them 49 weeks, but my share of it is only roughly half a person week. It's getting better. And after that, really, all those people who go to standards bodies and, and make those ontologies which are made by the universities and the countries and the cities and the governments and the, world, and the International Standard Organization, and heaven forbid, the World Wide Web Consortium, I don't even know them. They just do their work. 
right? But if you do meet them, you should really, you should buy them a beer because they spend, when they make these international standards, it takes them 961 weeks by the calculation, right? But your cost, share of that cost is infinitesimal. So, well, it's gone off the scale of this particular table. And it doesn't show up when we add it all up. We actually find we're looking at 3.2 uh, weeks. Now, if a real serious project that is going to be a real serious contribution to society may actually need 10, uh, typically, say, I guess, 30 ontologies. So actually, it will be three from each level. So it's actually going to take 10 person weeks for a really serious major piece of uh, somatic web engineering. All right. So that's not a lot. The point is about this. OK, the, the, the numbers are, of course, total garbage. But the concept still works pretty well. And in fact, ISO, you know, ISO committees do typically have 31 people in them. And in fact, this N squared term is frighteningly close, <laughs> in my experience. But, the, but the, the main piece to remember is, is, is this uh, kindergarten lesson that if you do bit, or your bit, others will do theirs. And the result will be very efficient. So there's, there are reasons for having a fractal tangle out there. Okay, there's, not, there's reasons for not doing it all at the planet level because it will take too long. And there's reasons for not doing it all at the individual level, excuse me, uh, because I won't be able to, you'll be able to do it very quickly, but you won't be able to communicate with anybody. So if you do it in a fractal fashion, uh, in this sort of 1 over f <coughs> fashion, then hopefully we'll end up with a big mushy connection, set of ontology which connects so that it's not perfect, but we get up the connectivity we don't want to be able to do really wonderful things. Okay, so that's how the semantic web works when it comes to building ontologies. When it comes to the way we use it is we use it just like the, we use this data bus, this set of protocols, this, uh, this arrow. Actually, this is basically a conversion of the original World Wide Web architecture diagram where the arrow was HTTP, HTML, and, uh, and URLs, and above it, we have all the browsers below it, we have all the servers. And here the servers are things which, where whatever they have their data in, they turn it into RDF, they make it look like RDF, or they serve it using Sparkle, the query language server. And above it, all kinds of things, anything which uses data. And what we've had, what we've seen today are people doing, putting all their life sciences data in here, and then using their particular life sciences projects up here. And we haven't seen the very generic uh, systems, and I think that's one of the reasons why the semantic web isn't so evident to people, and uh, it hasn't just been picked up by people in the in the street. There are lots and lots of different ways, actually, of putting data on the web. As uh, there are lots of ways of putting documents on the web. Many people originally, as the web took off, they thought that people were typing all those files. In fact, they weren't. They were they they were all scripts which were answering the requests as they came in, looking at the URI and then generating the data. Same thing, of course, with the semantic web. You have all kinds of different things, generating data, <coughs> mapping it specifically from existing databases. And one of the things we've re been really lax about to date has been getting the tools out there for mapping existing enterprise data and existing scientific data onto the web, simply onto the semantic web. You use it by converting this SQL into Sparkle and getting the data out there into RDF. We've, uh, because the semantic web community has really been... Uh, has tended to, to just uh, convert bits when they needed it for test data and produce individual projects and hasn't provided good tools for getting the real data out there uh, and leaving it. The real, uh, and the important thing is if you put things on the semantic web, you don't have to change the way you're, we're maintaining the SQL database. Keep it running. This is, not, I'm not, this is not a plea for you to change the way you manage the data. It is the, it is the way that you should instrument it so that we can do more things with it, please. You can all do the same thing with XML databases, of course. Here, you, uh, you swap out X query, you adapt X query. And you, the main point is, in each case, you have a, some mapping from the schemas you've defined. The, the, when you design databases or schemas, you put in an awful lot of arbitrary decisions into the way you make a system, which has nothing to do with the real things your business is about, the real readings, the pieces of equipment the real customers in your customer relationship management system. They're all to do with the way you decided to structure your database. And the point about the semantic web is we get above that and we work at the conceptual level and everything is much easier. There was a great talk which is going to be repeated at XTech where it was uh, Jim Milton from Oracle gave a great talk demonstrating how if you take a semantic web query and then you look at, you can convert it into a, a SQL query on a database, but it tends to look, be, it's bigger, it's, it tends to look uglier and it 
is you have to do it knowing a whole lot of internals of the database while you're working at the, the, the SQL, uh, uh, sorry, at the Sparkle level, that's the semantic web query language, then you're operating at a higher level, you're operating at a conceptual level, and you don't have to worry about the particular type of database. So that's important things if you're doing real uh, practical things. So what, what's the whole set of these, uh, these protocols? This is the roadmap we put up uh, ooh, five, six years ago, maybe. And actually, so you know, we haven't finished it yet, but I must say it's, it's kind of nice to look back that, and see that, with, 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 that we're you know, building on XML, which clearly we had beforehand, and the URIs and Unicode. As you go up, more or less, this is sort of expressive power of language going up. We said we'll need a data language, which is RDF, and then we'll need a, a metadata language, a sort of a schema language for that, which was RDFS. And that was very simple. We have a much more powerful one, a description logic language called OWL now, and we realized we'd need a rule language. And at the time, we wondered whether rules would be then a superset of OWL, but no, the logic actually tells us that if we're going to make a rule language, sometimes horn rules will, will not be built on top of uh, description logic. So we've got a, complicated, a few complicated interactions here, but we've, gotten, we've got to the point where we're building rules now on top of all this. There's a sort of a dream. I mean, now, it gets more dreamy when we get to the idea of having unifying higher-order logic, which will allow us to express anything in any of the underlying languages in the same language. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do that, because uh, I thought it would be very useful to be able to ex send a proof from one inference engine to another, because inference engines have different, when the, they use different techniques, they have different powers, they can re use different languages, they can come to different results. But supposing they all had the same way of expressing a proof of how they got there, you might have different, a proof engine which found something using a particular algorithm that nobody, that nobody else on the planet uses, but it can still explain which facts and which rules it used, even though it can't, doesn't need to tell you how it found them. Uh, it can, you can exchange the proof. So the proof, in a way, becomes, as a document format, becomes more universal than any of the logic languages underneath it, perhaps. And part of the reason for being able to send around a proof was that we want to be able to build trustable, tr trustworthy systems, all right, because there are all these very, very so important social considerations. And to build a trustworthy systems, we want to take the proof. You can take proofs, and then if you include in the proof engine something which can check logical proofs, but also it can check digital signatures, then you have the Lego building blocks for making all kinds of more or less custom-designed trustable trust trusting systems where the trusted computing base, the, thing, the piece of code you actually have to test, is really quite small. It just tests proofs, and it, and it can test digital signatures. But because you're using a fairly powerful logic language for expressing who you trust to say what about what for what, you, for what purpose, you're actually expressing the real trust that you have, that, that your company has or your university has, uh, so that you're not forced, trying to force your trust into some pyramid-like PKI system of authentication, which doesn't really, where, where really the fact that VeriSign knows somebody isn't the reason that you trust them. Or reason, you know, that you can trust them because you've met them and you've exchanged cards, you've done whatever, what, they work for a given uh, partner of yours, you can represent the, the trust really as it is to the machine, so the machine can really help you implement it. So that was the plan, and you know what? We have worked our way through that stack. Here's the same stack. Uh, the sort of the water is washing across it. I, in, it was up to this white, first white line in 1998, maybe 2003. This, the water got a bit further. Now we have the query. We've split the rules and query into two. We've, the query language is in the final stages in the working group. The rules is just starting off. We haven't done crypto, but actually there is a, the crypto. There's, we've, got, we've got some XML digital signature standards, which are pretty much. Uh, pretty much there. So the wave is advancing. The wave, this is a wave which shows how things move from, from the research ag agenda through languages which have been divine, designed but aren't, aren't standards which are shared by everybody to standards which are shared by everybody and then can be part of a global infrastructure and then through to wide deployment. And until you've got web standards in this business, you don't get wide deployment. You can, and if you design a better mousetrap, you can just start making better mousetraps and selling them down in the market, but if you design a new communication protocol, uh, like a new instant messaging system or something, somehow you have to persuade, have to get enough people using out there so there's a fair chance that the person you want to communicate with is using the same protocol. So getting to that point needs getting, means getting everybody together to agree on standards. So in fact, standards and research, they're not just you know, the standards, one is not the boring part or the exciting part of the other. 
they, if you're really going to have a technical deployment path for research, you have to, in this business, it has to be uh, through standards. And OWL was, in a way, for the DAML program, which was, a, and the oil, oil was European, roughly, and DAML was roughly uh, American. They were, fu they were uh, funded using research grants, and the, and, uh, and the funders were very happy to find that the, that the results were produced, this web ontology language, OWL. And they felt that they'd done their tech transfer. So that's, so that's the, the semantic web wave. It takes a lot of time okay, uh, to do these things. Uh, the, so these slides are on the web, and the URI will be, uh, I will, is on the last slide as well as the first slide. So you don't have to take notes. And these, uh, there are links here. So if you want to get involved in this, you can go back and get involved in those, uh, those, uh, those groups. So this wave is spreading. Right? But if you, you know, if you think of the web, the web, the first memo was 1989. By you know, the first code, 1990, it was sort of released in high-energy physics, 90, and then it was sort of on the net for, for geeks in 91, and then more geeks in 92, and by 93 it was in the papers, more or less. There's, I think The Economist being the first. And then sort of by the 1994, 95, it was in the tabloids. So over more or less five years, it had, it had taken off. Why can't we do the same for the semantic web? Well, maybe you've guessed some of these things. Uh, but I, we've obviously been thinking about this because we have to think where are we going to put our energy um, and what sort of size should I put in a talk like this. But actually, one of the interesting things is that it was really difficult to persuade, to explain to people what the web would be like before the web. This is now the, the fact that it was so difficult to explain to people what the web was like before the web is now extremely difficult to explain to anybody after the web. So anybody who's younger than a certain age had just, has got the concept of click, right? Right, uh, of click and going to, and, and links and on the web, right there. Then they understand it's, they understand it's web-like nature. But, but before that, people worried about, were terrified of being lost in hyperspace. The, or, or they felt that, it, the web, that links should be much more complicated and simple links wouldn't be enough. Or simple links were much too complicated. Or it should be hierarchical. It, it, you know, or, there were all kinds of reasons why people didn't really... And, and the biggest one is, you know, so, so big deal. You know, so you've shown me a document linked to another document. What's the big deal? Why should I use your funny angle brackets? And explaining to people that... And then you find, in a lecture theatre this big, there may, may be four people who, where you'd see that little glint no, not a flash, but a glint of an eye, <laughs> of somebody's eye. I think you see that somebody gets it and somebody goes off that night and fires up a web server, downloads the code and fires up a web server and puts some stuff on it. So somebody goes out and gives themselves the URI, puts a bunch of really interesting scientific data on the web. We just need a few people, and those people are doing it. But the fact that, but the whole idea of understanding the web-like nature of it, and the fact that the value of your bit depends on the value of what's out there, we're having to learn all over again. The fact that we now, it's totally intuitive the, the, how the web works, isn't good enough, doesn't allow us to under, make the leap of understanding how we can get the spreadsheet into something which the whole world can suddenly make use of. Um, I think one of the reasons why it's actually difficult is that designing these logic languages actually is a whole lot more complicated and difficult, because if you, especially if you try to do it right, and mercifully we have quite a lot of people in these working groups who try, do try to do it right, as well as the others who are just trying to do it tomorrow and get the data out. I tend to be in the latter category. Um, I sort of write the program first and figure out what it did afterwards. But, <laughs> Uh, but data is trickier, so the work of producing the standards, and to a certain extent the work of, uh, uh, of building software to use it is more, is more complicated, it's, so, it, so it takes longer. But another reason is that we've got the eyes of the world on the semantic web. So we have the tabloids asking us, so what's, you know, what's the semantic web done for me lately? Whereas this, the, the web took, took off largely in high energy physics. High energy physics was a neat place, okay? Smaller community. You can, it's much easier to get 10% of high-energy physicists to have a web browser on their desk than it is to get 10% of the entire planet to get web browsers on their desks. And high-energy physicists, they had dire need because of these international collaborations to exchange documents and to be able to browse between documentation systems as they put together these huge accelerators. Uh, they, had, and they had this you know, great sort of, uh, international community. They, had, they were early adopters. They already had lots of technology. They already had Unix workstations on their desk, unlike anybody else. And most of them had, had just at the point where I was inventing the web, had now internet connectivity because Europe had bowed to the pressure and was allowing internet uh, traffic through. 
rather than ISO traffic. And so, uh, so high-energy physics was a small, uh, enthusiastic, intelligent, imaginative, and creative group of people who, who had, a, had a serious problem. So they were great petri dish, if you like, for, for this mold of the World Wide Web to spread across. Uh, so we need something like that for the, sem for the semantic web. But perhaps another reason is that actually data isn't as interesting as web pages. You know, even if, uh, but because data tends to be to do with work. Web pages to do, to, tend to be to do with fun. Web pages are music and poetry. And data is, you know, physics analysis and spreadsheets and, and economics and, bu and budgets and stuff. So there's much less, woohoo, I've got my budget on the diplomatic web. I can trade, we can trade budgets. You know, it's much better, there's more woohoo about trading favorite films and, uh, and you know, uh, and pictures of, of, of vacations and things like that. So there's a certain fact that it's less exciting. However, among those people who are really interested in doing things large scale and changing the world, the, the doing stuff with data is very, very much more powerful, of course, because the fact that you can use computers then to analyze it and to cross the links and to join things, the amount of analysis you can do and the amount of conclusions you can come to across it compared to what a computer can do looking at the web. So for the computer, it's much more exciting, but computers haven't yet got to the point that they can tell us about this or even, um, or even envisage it. So we have to do that for them. There's this fear of having to make ontologies, but we've dealt with that, okay? Total cost of ontologies, finite and fairly small. So the good news is now that the, uh, that the logic discussions are actually getting done. We've got, oops, Owl, excuse me, I just sort of wrote these on the train. Um, Owl, Sparkle, and, and the rule interchange format, is it, as it will now be coming. Owl is baked. Uh, there's a, uh, a 1.1 flavor going to be produced, maybe even an L2, but L is out there, you can use it. RDF is so big that, of course, the data language, then you can put it on the side. Sparkle is in the final stages, as I said, and the work on the rule interchange format is just starting. So we're getting through, we are making our way through the roadmap. And we haven't even completely redrawn the roadmap, which you know, we've redrawn it a little bit, but, but we more or less kept to, the, kept to the plan. We do have incubator communities. And in fact, there are quite a few really interesting ones. One of the exciting ones uh, from which I brought that, that Venn diagram side came from is the life, the life sciences, in particular drug discovery. The drug discovery folks have really serious problems. Well, they have problems where if they solve them, then they will find a cure for schizophrenia or they will find a cure for cancer or a cure for AIDS or a cure for the latest virus. And there's a really large amount of incentive. And even the computer scientists who get within 100 miles of the scent of doing that sort of, working on that sort of problem, tend to get swept in and just really driven to get involved and try to help get that genomics data out there and to say where we can use it and we can connect it with the proteomics data and we connect it with the biopathways data. Because currently inside a drug, uh, drug company, you'll find that the genomics data is in the genomics department, and it's, uh, there are genomics ap application programs connected to all this genomics equipment, which produces genomics data, and you, and, and you can look at it using genomics visualizers. And if you're, and you, you're looking at matrices of dependencies and interactions between proteins, and, uh, and that proteomics is your thing, you've got a, a different terminal in a different building, and you may have an idea about possible drugs but you have no idea as to whether we know, we know the, 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 whether we got a good connection with the genes and whether the genes that produce and stable and so on. And so what you have to do is to take a piece of paper and look over somebody's shoulder you know, and, and, and go and you know, read off long complicated formulae to them or send them email and have them cut and paste it into their, into their visualization system, let them have a look at that and then go back to your drawing board. And this is no, you know, this is no good, not a way to run a restaurant, especially when it's not just proteomics and genomics. There's all the, you want to then, if you'll look at all, the moment you've got an idea that you might be able to use this drug for curing schizophrenia, then actually it's been used for all kinds of other things. You initially want to go over all the clinical tri trial data which has been used for the other drug, looking at whether it's, uh, look, looking to see what uh, no matter what it was originally used for, whether any of the people happened to have schizophrenia and whether they died and whether they got better and things like that. So there's clinical trial data and there's also there is all the government data about what you can do with drugs and what you can't do with drugs. Uh, there's all kinds of different parts of 
being a drug company, which are in silos. They're in these stovepipes, vertical things, which are not connected. So there's a, there's a strong push to get, them, to get those connected. Uh, so people in these fields are bright and intelligent. They are early adopters. They have quite a lot of money to throw at a problem. And they are, unlike most people in the street, where if you go, go to your, so somebody running the garage down the road and suggests that he integrates his data using all his enterprise data using semantic web technologies and mentioned that this might involve making ontologies of the sorts of things he does to cars, he might look at it with a blank star, blank stare, but if you go to a, a biochemist and say that you'll need an ontology of the, the things they deal with, they say, oh, we have so many of those. Which one would you like? We do that all the time. Uh, that's the way they get it. That's the first thing they do naturally before breakfast. So... Uh, so they are now working to, for example, try to harmonize a bit the concept of what exactly is a protein, where, you draw, where do you draw the line between one, something being the same protein and something being a different protein. And there's the Uniprop database, which has got data and identifiers for all these data. We're working to try to get them to give them HTTP identifiers so that all the rest of us can go and look up this information. And at the moment, you tend to, you know, there's a huge amount of data out there. The Biopact project has amassed uh, lots of stuff. There are all kinds of really interesting things, like the, the mouse brain atlas I heard about the other day. And, there, uh, and there's a human, not to mention the Human Genome Project. There are huge amounts of data, which is actually available to everybody. It would be very nice if it was available as a web of data that one could browse around, and that a machine could browse around. Actually, the nice thing about making data so that you can browse around, it turns out that if you make your data browsable, then there are certain sorts of query which a machine can you can prove a machine can just answer just by following the links. If you're doing you're trying to match a graph and somebody's made links across, between the documents and they made when they put back links in, it turns out that if the, if you put back links in, so wherever there's a link between two documents, there's another link backwards. Then that uh, a system can just resolve a query by by match the graph just by sucking in all the pieces of data off the web. We'd like to be able to do that with this stuff in the life sciences. So the so we have an incubator community there. Actually, basic science. It would be kind of nice to get K and Levy textbook, whatever people use nowadays, so that the basic data in there, modulo sort of copyright, whole, copyright of, the, of the lab textbooks, but the data, basic data about the density and melting points of things, uh, the periodic table. There are various periodic tables on the web. I don't know. One day we'll settle with the URI for helium, and that would be very nice. And I hope that when I dereference the URI for helium, I will indirectly be able to find, not only, I will immediately find everything that somebody in school will want to know about it, and indirectly I will be able to find all the data I want that a cryogenicist or a radio, you know, any scientist, any, any sort might want to know about helium by following links from the URI for helium. So we can start with basic science. That's very, for me, that's very appealing just because I'd like to be able to enable all those kids who are doing their projects in school to be able to suck the data down, stick it in a graph, uh, without having to draw stuff on graph paper, which can be really irritating. Um, so we've got uh, life sciences. We've got, Nigel, we were saying on the, uh, on the train, environmental sciences. Yes, geosci geospatial data, actually. Is, you know, one of those big main lines connecting things is position. And there's a huge amount of data, geospatial data there. After 9-11, New York, retrospectively, bolting the door after the horse had bolted, as it were, got all the data they had about their city, and they put it in maps. Wherever they, something was about a person, they sort of flagged it with where that person lived. And they produced these many, many layered maps using complicated geospatial systems which exist. And they found that, in fact, when they did that, it was very powerful, if you're in an emergency, to be able to just look at, select, the, select all the data you have by looking against latitude and longitude is pretty nifty, very powerful thing. And now people like doing that with their friends. I saw, just got invited to join a website where you put your friends on the map instead of, uh, 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 instead of ex explaining what photographs uh, they're in or putting your photographs on the map. Now you put your friends on the map. People looking at things on the map is really exciting. So geospatial information, especially if it can be based, if we can get some basic raw data from the Ordnance yeah. Survey, for example, out there so that if you want to, if you want to put a random, results of a random experiment, then, uh, then it will be very exciting in this country. And there's already some data you can get in the, from the US census, for example, so that, uh, to, to create a, a basic web of information about related to place. Uh, and then when I draw a diagram of my ski trip and, I, and my photos appear on it, it won't just be a red line on a green background. It'll be a red line on maybe a satellite photo of the place where we were skiing. Uh, so 
so the good news is the total cost of ownership of ontologies is finite, we've, as I've mentioned. There are startups. The, the thing is actually taking off. There are quite a lot of startups now. Uh, of course, startups can come and go. But <laughs> there are uh, more and more. It's more and more. And if you just listen to the buzz in the, uh, about Semantic Web at things like the last World Wide Web Conference we had just had in France, uh, it's getting, becoming more and more understood. And even, even the XML geeks who thought that XML could, would do everything they ever wanted to do now are, are realizing that actually RDF it does make life easier and scales better and so on. Not only are there startups, but there are also there are major vendors that, who regarded it with some skepticism, who, when it started off, actually gave talks in which they declared that they had no interest in the semantic web as being an interesting, and then the next year declared that the conference they were sponsoring the semantic web was the most interesting thing to look out for. Uh, there, there are companies mentioning their names. Uh, there are companies who have, who, who found that some of their smaller products on the, uh, are, which were not the mainstream products, had been converted into RDF products by their customers. And they were now the customers were asking them to sell it to them as an RDF product, are now realizing that the next version of their mainstream database systems are going to be, have to be RDF aware. And that they will, then you will design ontologies rather than designing databases, and the machines perhaps will design the databases, things like that. So there is, an, so there is going to, there's an understanding that everybody is going to end up connected to the semantic web bus in the future. And I think one of the most important things is to not to rush people out there, to rush buyers, to expect, look, make people look for shrink, shrink wrap software to, to download, as it were, uh, immediately. But to, for people to realize that now is the time to get your skunk work projects. If you're a university, you should use, using, be using semantic web, period. But if you're, and if you're a business, then you should have somebody who understands it and is doing and messing around with it. Uh, unless you're the some sort of business which is way out there ahead of the game. Okay, in which case, see me afterwards. So, um, we'll put your name up in lights. Um, and the other good news is we've actually got some, uh, some ideas about making user interface. We realized that, this, that I've always said that when people said, so what's the Semantic Web browser? When people said that, I said, no, you don't get it. Semantic Web is not about browsers, it's about data. You know, the stuff that drives your calendar program. It drives your map program, but it's, you don't see the data, right? You don't, hopefully, you don't have to look at the rows of numbers. But in fact, you realize that one of, the, one of the more effective data applications for real people out there is the spreadsheet. In fact, it is a frightening fact, I understand, that an awful lot of important scientific data is stored in spreadsheets. And it's stored in the spreadsheets on the laptops of physicists, for example. So if you've got, so, so first of all, back them up. When was the last time you backed up your, <laughs> seriously, think about that. Back up, okay, the next thing you do, convert it into RDF somehow. The next thing you do, stick it on a web page. Even if nobody understands it now, posterity may be glad because they may actually want to know what it was you actually did. And they may be able to use that experiment you did for, for, uh, for, for greater things that you cannot even imagine yet. So convert it in RDF, stick it on the web. And so we were, so, but we, we don't have something which would give the equivalent of the spreadsheet. And actually spreadsheets, trying to find something to knock the spreadsheet off its perch. Uh, is, is quite tricky. So we've now realized that actually setting out, throwing down the gauntlet, setting up the challenge for making the best possible semantic web interface. Just imagine a totally enabled user with a huge screen and pedals and a keyboard and mice and cord keyboards and, and joysticks, give, you know, whatever, and goggles. How do you give that user the most power in investigating all the data that's out there and solving the problems of life, the universe, and ever? Uh, whatever. Do they fly through three-dimensional representation of it? Do they slice it and dice it? Do they write long, complicated equations and have something behind the scenes cough up a single number? Uh, I guess it depends on the user. <laughs> People like different user interfaces. But we have, we have been playing with it. And in fact, now, thanks to this, this uh, Ajax JavaScript environment, I've actually spent a little time over the holidays doing it myself. So, and so, we, so I can actually, and I, I think I might actually have connect, connectivity. So for example, uh, here's a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, and the, the, the uh, let, me, uh, let me start from scratch and a great risk reload it. Okay, so you can write that down. That, this is an alpha version. This is the version that our undergraduate was just hacking on the other day. So anything might happen. Uh, if we load this, this is a piece of, this is just a, like a browser within a browser, and it's, uh, and this, in fact, if I click on this, you see that what, when it says W3C, actually, that's a URI. 
this, in this, this line represents something. It's the World Wide Web Consortium. It's not a part of a document. It's a thing. It's an abstract thing. And I can look and see if we've got any data of it. Oh, we haven't. But oh, that's because this blue dot, the blue dot means. Can you read that at all? Shall I zoom it up, Mark? No, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Yes, it was, I, sorry, Wendy, I waited for the person in the back. <laughs> right. Okay, good. So, so suppose then I click on the blue dot and do the, 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 the internet thing. So now what I'm doing actually is I'm dereferencing, I'm looking up HTTP www.wt.org slash data. Hash W3C is the concept within that document, the document talks about. And actually when I pick that up, you can see from this little under the hood here, under the bonnet, we see that it's picked up this data, but also that, that, that document uses various ontologies, so it's picked up the metadata about those. It's picked up some uh, ontologies. It's got the, well, the idea of syntax is a very basic one. It's picked up, and a friend of a friend ontology has been used there, and the idea of scheme has been used, and owl has been used, and something what, I don't know what, what, what 0 0.1 uh, has been used there. It must have been used in one of the other ontologies. And this semantic web vocab status slash ns, don't know what that is either. But anyway, the interesting thing is that when you look up the ontologies, and you look up the ontologies used by the ontologies, and the ontologies used by the ontologies, one of the little rules we have, which works pretty well, is that's finite, in fact, small, <laughs> and it, it, it's of order 10. So, uh, we pick, so we end up picking up a few, few documents. Now we have some data at W3C. Not very much. Oh, we've got a logo. Uh, we've also got a see also link. We say there's more information here about the W3C groups and organizational structure we can pick up. And if I click on that, then we end up putting in more data. And this is actually, this, and, I, and we can, uh, so, uh, and so now we open this out, we can start looking at the, oh, this has a concept of domain. <coughs> and we can look at, let me refocus on domain. Now let's have a look at some of the domains in here. Look at the, uh, uh, this domain, it's got a, uh, it's got various activities, including the technical architecture group, that's one I'm happy to be on. Um, oh, there's. It's got some information about me. Now, and as we go down here, we get, so we find that uh, this data, in fact, was all in that document. But suppose now we pick up some more information. Why am I losing that? Um, I'm not used to this green size. Um, we, we can also pick up uh, information. We can pick some more information about me. We can pick up some more from my, uh, my friend of a friend page, fourth page. We can pick up some information about WTC standards and technical reports and things. That will take a long time because we have made so many documents. Uh, and this is a really simple piece of JavaScript, putting in all the data and, uh, and storing it and so on. Uh, we'll start with this. this this, this, so this is a semantic web browser. It's actually, it looks like an outline browser, so it looks as though it's browsing a tree. I think for a long time, people felt they had to show semantic web browser data as circles, narrows, diagrams, as graphs. And what, no chalk. Um, <laughs> so, and so you get all these, uh, so lots of the semantic web browsers look like this. And when you represent data, like the data we've just got on the, had on the screen there, like that, it rapidly fills all the backboards, and it becomes really impossible to browse this. So this is a, actually a tree browser, but it's, you know what? Uh, it, it's okay. The data isn't really a tree, but it doesn't matter. You get some backlinks. And it's much more compact. It's much more like the sort of thing people uh, like to find. And then when we look at, if, so um, now, oh, look, now I open up the data about me, and because these data, they share URIs, or sometimes they share things like homepage address or email addresses, which allow you to identify the people. Then, and it's got all kinds of, uh, so we find that there's more information about me. Now, so we've now got an integrated view, which, where we started off looking at the structure of the World Wide Web Consortium, now we looked at, and now we're looking at uh, me, and we find that, oh, I have various acquaintances. Let's, um, let's pick up that one. How come is the alias for uh, Hokon? He used to work with us, actually. He works at Opera now. Uh, Opera, when you join the Opera community, everybody in the Opera community gets to produce their data about their friends if they don't, if uh, if, if they don't mind. It's exported in RDF, so it's part of the semantic web. So I can find that he actually has friends like Peter Carlson. I have to explicitly pick up his friend of a friend file. And so, I can, so here I am wondering, now I'm off in the middle of the Opera community. Okay, and I started off W3C, and we went through the fact that I knew Hokon. 
<coughs> and, we're, we're, and we've gone through both di various different ontologies. And uh, goodness knows what I'd find out if I went on. Uh, uh, also with this thing you can tabulate. So one of the things you can do, which I won't do now, is to say, all right, well, that's, now that was interesting. You found a friend of somebody who was a chair of a group of W3C. How many friends of people <laughs> at W, of, uh, of people who, are, who lead groups at the consortium are there? And so you can hit the tabulate button, and on a good day, the system will try to follow all the blue links, It'll click on all the blue buttons which are relevant, pick, pick, up, pick up all the data, and, uh, and, show you, uh, and show you the result in a tabular format. Because tabular format is what people are actually used to when they look at their data. But when you look at your, if you have iTunes and you look at your data, the idea with, it, with this is you should be able to have a, a system which is as powerful as iTunes for looking at your music and as powerful as iPhoto for looking at your photos and as powerful as your, whatever calendar system you use for looking at your calendar and as powerful as Quicken or whatever money system you use for looking at your budget. But you should be able to just go through or look at, take a date and find all the photos taken on that date and, the, uh, and where you were on the date, what you, uh, what you were doing on the date and the bank statement entries that happened on that date. Uh, and what else did I say? Anyway, so you should be able to look at all your personal information and all the information that's public out there just and, and fly through there. So anyway, that is, so, so that is... Uh, a very, very simple and crude, if you think it's not sufficiently sophisticated for you, it's JavaScript, it's very simple, you can download it, it's open source, you can go and make a better one, that's the whole idea of doing things in a crummy fashion. Okay, that's how open source works, so I'd be very, very happy for, to get emails in the next week from people who've decided that was crummy and decided they could do it themselves better. Okay, so we have some ideas about making user interfaces, and there are actually some much better user interfaces that are there, which obviously we could put in, like, like Google Maps and, and, and calendars and things like that, and M-Space like systems for looking at iTunes. And uh, so hopefully we're going to make some progress on that, and that will actually provide some incentive for people to just put their data up there, because people they'll be able to look at it and slice through it and, uh, and tabulate it. So I'm pretty. So even though progress is slow, it's still very exciting. And basically, I am optimistic. Thank you very much for your attention. speak informally as well, uh, Tam and, and among ourselves. But uh, if, if we could get a few questions, we'll need to bring a microphone to people who have a question to ask. So the two microphones, this one, uh, can you get... get to let the people with Hello, the Sir Tim. My name's Mike Rule of the Open Media Foundation. Um, for some time now, we've been in negotiations with Google and others to make the internet better to use for completely blind people. We've made no progress at all. With your support at the World Wide Web Consortium, we could really make a difference. Will you help us? Definitely. <laughs> Promise. We, of the World, Wide, the World Wide Web Consortium, while I suppose, while with, we were looking at its uh, structure, it did, ha did have, it has four domains. And of those four domains, we looked at the, uh, the bottom one. One of them is the Web Accessibility Initiative. Are you aware of the Web Accessibility Initiative? Yes? Or so you can shake or, sh or nod your head. Yes. No, you're aware of this. So the Web Accessibility Initiative is specifically there to make the web accessible. Not, obviously, just for visually impaired people, but for people who have all kinds of different reasons why they need to adapt the way they use a computer. But it's very important to us. Uh, one of the exciting things about web technology, of course, is that you can put information on the web in such a way that it can be accessed very differently by different people. Uh, the Web Accessibility Initiative has, I think, been fairly successful, though I say it myself. Uh, Judy Brewer, well, I can say it because Judy Brewer, who heads it up, uh, and has spent a lot of time in the accessibility uh, area and has, in the past, found herself in a disability organization lobbying from outside trying to change technology. Now she says it really has been like a breath of fresh air being inside the organization which is producing the standards, being able to review them and talk to the working groups at any time, even before they're chartered, uh, in order to make sure that they understand how they can, there are axes along which they can be uh, really good or really bad. 
of making things accessible. So we have the Web Accessibility Initiative, which is w3.org slash WAI, it, uh, has a series of, um, of guidelines for use when you are making a web page. It has guidelines for use when you are making a website. It has guidelines for when you ma are making software that people will use to make websites. Uh, and it's quite important that those, those, uh, those guidelines which have been developed by an international group are adopted across the world uniformly. We, the, one of the dangers is that individual countries feel that they, uh, they feel, think they were going to do the right thing, and they'll start a different group to make a different set. So we end up with incompatible guidelines, and then you can't, uh, you can't meet all of them. Uh, there's, there are, these guidelines allow you to test your site. There are some automatic tests. A lot of the tests can't be done automatically because they really need a human to judge whether the subtitling is good, for example, or the, the alternative text is good, and, uh, and so on. But that's something which is really important to us. Actually, another thing which is, so, so when you look at the Web Accessibility Initiative, um, you'll be able to, uh, 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 the, the way technical activity has all kinds of parts. Actually, it, it, you don't see when you look at their structure what they're doing, because in fact, they're, they're active in every other, in every other uh, activity. Uh, they, they monitor and they, they liaise with all the other groups. So yes, that's, uh, that is very important to us, and hopefully, the semantic web will be another uh, will be another tool for accessibility. Because when the data is out there as raw data, that really maximizes its reuse. So it maximizes the variety of ways in which you can present it. So, for example, instead of having a uh, uh, different types of web page, some of which are high contrast and use short, uh, short words and are in black and white instead of pink on, pink on green. Uh, if the data is out there, you, can, you could write a conversational natural language semantic web browser which will take a user through the data and uh, uh, help them find out what they want. So I've got good hope for the semantic web there too when it comes to accessibility. Thanks. Good question. Do you think government organisations such as the Audience Survey should be um, opening access to their basic data rather than charging and licensing for it at the moment? And is that, is that holding back the semantic web? I think that... I know that when the web first started, there was... Uh, when people originally put data on, there was a certain amount of difficulty in letting go, which was in some cases very understandable because people didn't understand about whether their copyright would be respected and, uh, and so on. They didn't really understand how the data would be reused until pe people got used to it. So now people understand what's implied when you put something in a blog, for example. Uh, initially, uh, bookstores were very loath to put information about their stock on the web. They'd have a, an invitation to come to the store, but they didn't want to actually allow you to browse the catalog because that was commercially sensitive data, which their co competition could find out. But then the moment their competition had the stock allowed you to browse the catalog, then of course they put it on. But of course they did, still didn't put on the prices of the books because that was commercially sensitive information, which would certainly allow their customers to, uh, to compete uh, until the customers had the prices on. You know, and they are absolutely bound to. So bit by bit, this openness came about. And now we have a situation where you can f check how much it's going to be before you go to the bookstore, or of course, you can directly order it online. Now, with there's a very interesting situation, and I think actually a lot of we the people need to figure out what we, what we want here. There is a lot of data which has been collected by governments. And I think, you know, I'm a great fan of maps. I won't tell you how long my shelf of Ordnance Survey maps was when I lived here. I'm always <laughs> getting that out of date now. But um, I love maps, and so I think that, and, and I think that, and I feel that it's a really important uh, dimension in which to correlate data anyway for, us, uh, for all kinds of scientific purposes. I'd like uh, school kids to be able to do ecological experiments in. Uh, in their back gardens and, uh, and immediately put, produce beautiful maps, uh, high resolution and so on. I think that when you're trying to do planning, town planning, goodness, if you can't get them, get, and your neighbor is going to do something and you can't pick up the plans of their house, then how are you going to figure out whether the extension is going to block your light? So you know, there's a lot of argument which says that for a well-run country, we should know where we are, we should know where things are, and that data should be available. However, it, does, it, uh, it actually costs money to make maps. So we have to figure out 
whether that money will be paid for out of taxes or whether we will charge in a certain way, whether we will make it uh, free to educational use up to a certain level and then, we'll, um, and then we'll, ch and we'll charge for commercial use. I would like to see a certain amount, I think certainly uh, mapped down to a certain scale. If there's an argument that it should certainly be. It's sort of the route planning maps. Uh, that data, if you don't make it publicly available, there will be people out there, they are ready with their cars and their GPS devices, driving around with their laptops. The same people who've been, who've been have secret catalogs of all the cell phone tower, towers with their, with their coordinates and their, you know, and, and their details, and the secret catalogs. You know, they will be cataloging every lane and enjoying it, driving with, through in four by fours behind your farm, the dead of night, uh, taking contour, with altimeters, taking contour readings, and, you know, and there will, if necessary, be a grassroots remapping, and that would be silly. Right, but that said, <laughs> so, but that, uh, but that said, uh, I think it's, it is important, and I'm prepared to pay for, map, pay for maps. Uh, I would love to be able to pay, pay for the rights to access maps and then have my web browser, my semantic web browser, just be able to include the, uh, the geographic component to a greater detail than somebody who hasn't paid the money. But I don't want to have to buy your own survey viewer, and you still haven't got it, I think, ready, working on a Mac let alone Linux. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, but it's not that, it's not that I, I just want it running in every platform. It's that I want the data. To, I want to do stuff with the data. I want to be able to join it with all my other data. I want to be able to do the Google Maps things to a ridiculous extent, not limited in the way that Google Maps limits you. So, yeah, basically, to one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm Paul Frather from the European. I just wanted to say, listening to you, Sir Tim, how um, struck I was by the amazing progress you've made with this um, philosophical engineering. Because I remember you came here almost five years ago. And in fact, you came from my organization. We're very proud to have you. And you laid out a map plan for the semantic web. And you were speculating that you weren't sure how long it would take you. Five years, 10 years, 15 years. And you gave this marvelous example of um, getting into your car and going home and your fridge talking to you in the car as you went past the little corner shop and reminding you to pick up a, a bottle of milk because you hadn't got any in the fridge. Or it, actually, even more complicatedly, it had gone off. And so you were giving, uh, and I thought that was a wonderful illustration of, of your notion of the semantic web, being, data being able to interact with other data and giving you a, a kind of positive result. So um, my question was, well, so that was my observation. My question was, to what extent over the last five years do you think that um, open access and contributions from, if you like, we the people, to use your phrase, has helped you move so fast? Because clearly that was one of the great stories of the 20th century, that the web was developed by people collaborating not by a, an elite or by a company or by... I wondered how much we could, we could hear from you had help, you'd been helped in the same process over the last five years. So, so really, so to what, so to what extent have, has, has your organization been helped by outsiders contributing ideas? You've asked us to ah, use right. Java and, and, and help you. I mean, can you, can you quantify thank you, thank or explain how, how the progress has been helped well, by... Uh, the program has been helped, and you know, with the web, it was very much seemed to be random people—people people on the internet, people who are savvy. But then, when Kevin Hughes and the University of Hawaii put together uh, a dinosaur museum at the University of Hawaii, that nobody would have, you know, even Asimov psycho histories, people wouldn't have tried to predict that one. <laughs> so uh, we've, so in fact, so there have been some uh, some really nice. Things, but it hasn't been so much grassroots. It has been funded projects largely who have had serious pieces of data and have been funded to do semantic web things with it. Alas, a lot of the semantic web funding has been aimed at semantic web services, which is semantic web use for web services, because web services is what industry is crying out for at the moment. Uh, so not a lot of it is, not all that money has gone into putting data on the web. In fact, very, so I, it's in a way disappointing the fact there's not more data on the web, but I think we sort of the, the, uh, the I'd accept sort of responsibility for not having pointed out that's what we have to do. 
That's, you know, as I had in this talk. Okay, the uh, sort of when you, the, just asking you to go and stick some, uh, put some data on the web when you get home. For those of you with laptops, before you leave the auditorium, uh, put, you know, find some data that's useful, put it on the web, you put useful stuff there. Uh, we've, that, there is, there has been, as I say, in life sciences, it's been really, uh, be really interesting. And some people have, there has been, what well, has started in the grassroots, interesting grassroots way, I mean, people writing scrapers for other people's data. Now, now strangely enough, you'd think that, that, that you think that the web took off as a, as a two-person thing. I publish, you read. The semantic web is starting to take off as, I publish, I have no idea about the semantic web. I, interested in the semantic web and interested in that data, write an XSLT script or a piece of JavaScript which scrapes that data and turns it into an RDF. I publish the fact that this script will produce good data for that, that page. And now, I, a third person, browsing around, and somehow I have to do the rather unscalable, difficult thing of not only finding that data but also finding this. So uh, and we don't have a great registry of these things where people will go. But things like the piggyback system, which, are, which is the sort of form of semantic web browser, has... It has the ability to absorb metadata about sites, about regular expressions which match, your, match to URLs. And if the URL looks like that regular expression, then it will apply a piece of JavaScript to the page. And all things being well, and no, the original person not having changed things, how it's, how it's encoded the HTML, which of course happens overnight, anytime with any of these scraping schemes, then you get data off. And there's some really, there's some really, some really interesting, uh, you know, you, if you want to, the examples are, uh, finding all the coffee shops in California or uh, finding flight times and sort of uh, p data that people have, have wanted to add to their maps, for example. So, yes, it is taking off from the grassroots, uh, but I hope that we can get much more of a grassroots effort. But I think it will be grassroots. You know, it won't be random people in their garages. It will be much more the uh, people with a scientific bent. Jim, in the interest of time, can I just get two questions? Okay. My name's Nico McDonald. Um, just at some point, could you put the URI back on the screen for your uh, presentation? Um, I, I said a, a slightly somber reflection is that I still don't think people understand the web in some ways. I think the affordances of the web, of something being central, up-to-date, editable, um, in one place, if you like, are still not understood by organizations when they want to, for instance, share common information about work on a project. You know, people still rely on email to do those kind of things. So I wonder how good a position we're in to be moving towards the semantic web. Well, and that's I, true too. Can, uh, 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 can, just, I, can I just continue, Tim? Because it... You want, you hang on, this so, is one of two questions, but so you're right. Go well, on. no, it's Fine. not. It's, um, in your book, for instance, um, you talked about the web being a blank page. You talked in this talk about there being no hierarchy and no central database of links and so on. And the web also has a characteristic of having very simple markup. So it's a a sort of lowest common denominator, and I think that's part of the reason for success. Whereas, to me at least, the semantic web uh, has a much higher barrier to entry in terms of complexity, in terms of collaboration and so on. And I wonder if, on the one hand, is the web just not, is it, is it good enough for what we need to do? And is it actually some kind of a barrier to the semantic web as you envision it? In, and do you actually have the ambition to make the semantic web? Or is, is the web as we have it good enough and actually going to be a barrier to progressing towards the semantic web. Are you, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that one. That's a good, that's a good thesis. But right. one more. Okay. Okay, my question will be shorter. Uh, I'm Andreas Bush from the Politics Department. My question is, uh, what the implications of what you uh, presented us uh, are for privacy? Um, I was wondering when I uh, said, uh, when I read your um, uh, implication, when you get home, make a friends of a friends page. What will all that do for identity theft? And if everybody can see your neighbor's house plan, what will that do for burglars? So my question is, what are the implications for privacy? Well, that's... Uh so, okay, so doing them in reverse order, the, 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 privacy, the privacy question uh, is, is huge. So the research that we're doing at MIT at the moment is on systems which process data but keep track of where it came from, and when they, when you, uh, when they tell you something, they, you can ask it why, ask it how it knows that. So if you're a police officer and you've just 
decided that, that you can arrest somebody because you, you found out they committed a crime, you can find out whether then, go back and find out whether the data which was used is data which you're actually allowed to use for arresting somebody for that particular offense. Or have you, in fact, used information which is only allowed for, to be used for tracking terrorists or, or arresting spies, you know, not for arresting parking offenders. So the, the, the part of the answer, answer we feel is being is where the information is available, because you just won't be able to stop. You know, where, where one government department has it, and the, and the person in the street can't encrypt it so that another government department can't read it. Then we have, that one of the answers is making systems which have transparency, where you, the, there's an expectation that you can ask somebody, well, okay, you believe that, but why do you believe that? And then we can set up rules about which, even if you know something, under what circumstances you're allowed to use it to deny somebody credit, to deny somebody board, be able to board a plane, or to fire somebody, or, or so on, uh, and so on, to set their insurance premiums, the sort of things people, that people worry about. Um, there are other areas where you just have to use, uh, you have to use cryptography to build secure systems when, you know, when lives are in danger or when you don't trust the system. So there's some data you just won't let out of the family, family circle. And then we need policy-aware systems which will, again, as they process data, not be aware of where it comes from, but also where it's going. So realize that if I involve family data in this, then it's got going onto the company website, not until we've, you know, it's been okayed. Uh, so, and, uh, simple rules that you won't allow pictures of the kids on in identifiable fashions, you know, onto any website, the, the rules that we have. It would be nice if there were systems which could just help us implement them by allowing us to express the rules in uh, standard language and allowing the system to be able to find, you know, correlate the data, determine who would allow to see. Uh, to see what. So yes, it's a huge, it's, it's huge. And I, gave, I talked about the semantic web today. I didn't talk about policy and technology uh, and, and, and society and how they connect together and transparent systems and so on. My colleague Danny Weitzner is an expert on these things and he leads the technology and society domain of the consortium. Uh, he's also a researcher at MIT. Uh, and uh, obviously Though that, those are very important, and where we build the semantic web, the power to abuse data becomes that much bigger. Uh, well, the power for odd people to abuse data will be much bigger. In a way, if you're government, you can use huge natural language processing systems to extract data from things, and you can, uh, and you can have, you can, where, where data is not easily analyzable, you can, uh, you can munge it and munge it until you find some statistical uh, clue as to who did something. Uh, but now, if the data is out there, as you say, any burglar will be able to pick up and find out, you know, will be able to work out when you go to work and work out which is the most burglarizable house. So we do absolutely have to be that. And, and, and it may indeed be that I get access to my neighbor's house because I'm, my, uh, I'm a neighbor. And that access has been registered in them, and, and the neighbor knows who, exactly who know, has seen the plans, and I'm under obligation not to disclose them to anybody else, and so on. Yeah. So that was a very good question. And the other question, was about the whole question, uh, it was a whole, about the whole web, and whether I'm actually happy with it at all, it seemed. And A, as, a, as an infrastructure for the semantic web, uh, seeing then B, all the things we wanted to do with it in the first place. And the answer is yes and no. In a way, as an infrastructure for the semantic web, HTTP and uh, the, the MIME type system and RDF, and now we have Sparkle on top of it, that's all we need. We don't need really, or we can use the same caching systems in HTTP and stuff. So really, we can deploy the semantic web largely exist using the existing web as it is, and we can even use, you know, we can reuse the, the, the caching system where we're putting data as, uh, data comes as documents and so on. Uh, so to, to first order, the app, the web, existing web works for developing the semantic web on it. But then the question about is the semantic web, is the original web or if we wanted it, everything we want it to be as a collaborative play space, as a place where we can naturally just share data and build stuff together and talk together, absolutely clearly not. No, a, the, as a collaborative space, it is really crude. We looked at the, we tried to just use conventional software for running our lives at the W3C, and we wondered why people didn't produce after a while fantastic group editors and uh, and, and great simple uh, web, edit web editors and things, you know, the things, sort of, sort of piece of software you need to, for making blogs and wikis and, and minutes of meetings and so on. And, they did, and then we realized that they were, people were going to do it, so we tried to do it ourselves. We started writing our own software just to run the consortium. So now we have a web server which has got a lot of stuff stuck on it so we can control the access to any 
document, for example, at a fine-grained level, any document, we want its, your, uh, URI to say the same, so we can change as it gets discussed by a larger and larger group to fit into the way we want society to, our little society to work, we have to exchange the readership, increase the readership of the document. So, we can, so we've got all this apparatus to control who gets to see what uh, so that people feel free to say really silly things in a working group context because they know that the first, you know, the minutes won't be released until they've had a chance to review them. So we found out that actually building these systems involve a lot of understanding of the social systems. And actually, when you talk about the group, hello, creating a group, when you, you, know, when you discuss, we perhaps should have, a, the system should create a group just for the people in this room automatically because we're all in the, in the same meeting at the same time. That should come from the fact that, we're, that, the, that if, we, you know, if we've signed a visitor's book, we should, we should be a group. At the moment, just creating the groups is very difficult. We haven't got infrastructure for a lot of that. We don't have group editors. Remember all that CSCW? Computer Supported Collaborative Work. You know, I thought that was, that was one of those things which I thought, oh, good, somebody else has done that. We can just use it. What happened to it? Where are they? Folk, you know, folks, well, you can do it on the web now. In fact, there are some suitable standards coming up for collaboration between, for, for group editors to communicate. Anyway, so yeah, I think there's the, from this, as a collaborative space, it really has got so much wanting. And we've been, uh, we, you know, when, uh, we use all the things like blogs and chat rooms and things that we can find and still uh, 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 and teleconference and things. And I think we've got a really, really long way to go. But that is really a different talk. Um, uh, I hate to be the timekeeper. I'm the one uh, when a gentleman wants to answer questions so fully. But uh, just one observation, which is uh, I, was, I was very surprised to the degree that, that the social embedded all the way through your talk and aligning technical rules and social rules and this marriage of technology and society was rippled through your talk. And then I was also surprised by how many questions from the audience were about policy. And uh, you said it wasn't about technology and policy and society, but it, the big central issue here is how do we bring policies social issues and technology together. This is one of the aims of the eHorizons Institute, and I'm uh, amazed that you brought it together today. So thank you very much. We have refreshments, so you can color Sir Tim Bennersley in the hall. So thank you very much.